Hi, I'm Chris Potts. This screencast is about the convention surrounding how we do things with words. That is, how we rely on linguistic cues to signal to others that we're performing certain speech acts. As we'll see, this is a highly uncertain, context-dependent process, but one that is guided by some very stable, albeit very general, conventions. Let's begin with the notion of a sentence type. This is often called sentence mood as well. Declarative is a sentence type. This seems like the default sentence type in English. The canonical use is to make a claim of some kind. For instance, I could claim that turtles are amazing using this sentence. This next one is a bit different. I express an inner state of wondering where Kim is. This sentence is another more subjective claim. You should move your bicycle. Perhaps some kind of advice based on how the speaker thinks the world works. Interrogative is another sentence type. This is the canonical way of posing questions. In English, interrogatives are generally defined by the inverted subject and verb, as in this example, is today Tuesday. And constituent interrogatives involve a fronted WH phrase like what, which person, and so forth, as in this example, what day is today. Here's an interrogative that perhaps seems less inquisitive than the others. This would likely sound very biased as a result of this on earth modifier. Another big clause type is imperative. These are characterized by lacking an overt subject and having an, a, a verb, often a main verb, in initial position. For instance, have a cookie, which is likely an invitation to the addressee. Uh, here's move your bicycle. This might be construed as a command or perhaps something milder like a request, depending on who is speaking, to whom, and other facts about the context. Here's a very short imperative, rain. Uh, this sentence is ambiguous. It could be exclaiming that rain has arrived. That's not the imperative construal, though. For the imperative, we need to think of this as a verb, so perhaps this is like a plea to nature. Now we're getting to more unusual clause types. Exclamatives come in a variety of forms. What a day is a sort of elliptical form, or what big eyes you have, or boy, is she ever smart. All of these look a bit like interrogatives, uh, and in some cases we might need an exclamation mark or a particle like boy or ever here to signal that the intended clause type is exclamative. There can be persistent ambiguities, but the types are clearly different. For instance, the WH forms don't have subject aux inversion. So the interrogative version of what big eyes you have would be what big eyes do you have. Well, there are lots of other clause types that we could consider. I don't actually know what the full list of English clause types is, to say nothing of what the full range of cross-linguistic variation is. It really depends on analyses by syntacticians and the fine details of how we decide to delineate the different types. That's all fine. Our goal is just to better understand a particular aspect of the semantics and pragmatics of all of this namely the convention surrounding the usage of these clause types. So for the remainder of the screencast, to keep things simple, I'm going to focus on just the big three, declaratives, interrogatives, and imperatives. The second major ingredient is illocutionary force. Here we see directly the sense in which we can do things with words, to borrow a phrase from the ordinary language philosopher J.L. Austin. These are often called illocutionary acts or speech acts. The idea is that with language alone, we can assert, question, exclaim, threaten, promise, apologize, command, warn, suggest, request, wager, ob object, christen, marry, bequeath, and on and on. This is just a sample of the many illocutionary acts one can perform. I just brainstormed a bit to come up with them, but there are lots of others. The common theme is that these are things that one can do just by speaking. For instance, there's really nothing more to making a promise than making a particular kind of statement in a particular context. An apology is a verbal act. For it to succeed, you probably need to sound sincere and so forth, but it's the act itself that constitutes the apology. Others of these probably started off as pure speech acts, but then some official bureaucracy formed around them, usually involving paperwork and signatures, which are themselves an inst extended kind of speech act. A uh, christen and marry are like that. You need to have the right authority, of course. That's a kind of presupposition. And then you just perform a particular elocutionary act. It's worth pointing out, too, that whether a particular speech act was performed can have serious consequences. For instance, there are legal consequences for making a threat or bequeathing something or issuing a command. Many court cases turn on whether a particular speech act was performed, and the issue is usually that the act was performed indirectly. 
For examples, I highly recommend the book Speaking of Crime by Lawrence Solon and Peter Tiersma. Now we come to the heart of the matter, relating sentence type to illocutionary force. First declarative. Our first example, Turtles Are Amazing, sounds like an assertion, and that conforms to common assumptions that declaratives closely associate with assertion acts. However, as we continue, things quickly get more complicated. The sentence, I wonder where Kim is, doesn't seem to assert so much as indirectly pose a question. And while You Should Move Your Bicycle does make an assertion, this seems to be only part of the story. It sounds more like a suggestion or maybe even a command. And You Can Have a Cookie sounds like an invitation. And how about, it would be a shame if something happened to your store. I suppose that's a claim, but it's easy to imagine scenarios in which it's a threat, especially if it's said in the right kind of menacing tone. And we might even wonder about the unusual sense in which its content is even being sincerely asserted at all. For all these examples, a claim is being made, but calling them assertion acts seems to miss a lot. Moving to interrogatives, is today Tuesday, and what day is it sound like genuine questions. But what on earth are you doing is so biased that we might even hear it more as an accusation. And do you want to have ice cream, though perhaps inquisitive in some sense, is meant to play the role of an invitation. Similarly, could you help me seems less like a query and more like a request. With imperatives, things seem most variable of all. This first one perhaps conforms to broad expectations for this clause type, move your bicycle sounds like a command. But have a cookie is likely an invitation. It could be construed as a command, but that would be pretty unexpected. Or consider rain read as an imperative. It's not a command to God or nature to produce rain. It's more like a plea. And get well soon is kind of absurd as a command or an invitation or a request. I suppose we should just call it a well wish. Finally, imagine a passenger in a car is giving directions to the driver and the passenger says, turn right here. Is that a request, or an invitation, or a command, or what? I'm not sure, but it seems like it doesn't matter as long as they achieve their goal. It's very common to find claims in the literature that these highlighted rows represent the canonical associations between sentence types and speech acts. Declaratives go with assertions, interrogatives go with questions, and imperatives go with commands. I think one might argue that this is broadly correct for declaratives and interrogatives, and the account described next makes good on that, I think, but it's hard to see how this could be motivated for imperatives. Indeed, commands seem like pretty specialized things. They require particular power relationships to hold between speaker and addressee, and they require that the speaker desires to invoke and hence reinforce that power relationship. Since this dynamic is pretty infrequent in everyday life at this point, we probably don't experience very many imperatives as commands. And where commands are issued, they are often given as declaratives, like you should move your bicycle, or interrogatives like could you move your bicycle, since these can meet other desirable social goals like politeness, while still conveying command acts. Thus these other uses, invitations, pleas, and well wishes, seem to have equal right to first class status for imperatives, and I don't see a reason to try to derive them from a more basic command use. We don't want to risk making the false claim that the addressee of, hey, have a cookie, feels like she is being commanded. For this last one, in the context of giving directions, I don't even know what the force is, and the speaker might not know either, but the whole thing still works. So what we want is a theory that embraces all of this variation while still capturing the underlying regularities between clause types and intended illocutionary acts. I think we find such a theory in the work of Cleo Kondorabdi and Sven Lauer. Cleo is my colleague in Stanford Linguistics, and she and I co-advised Sven's Stanford thesis. Cleo and Sven have done groundbreaking work on the type to force connection. Their work clarifies the apparently messy situation we just explored. The central idea is that sentence types are associated with conventions of use. These are broad statements about the kinds of things we're allowed to do with sentence types. And I believe they are meant to have a kind of normative quality. If you use this sentence type, you're thereby committed to at least this much. For instance, here's the declarative convention. It says, if a speaker S utters a declarative sentence with propositional content P, then S thereby commits to acting as though she believes P. This corresponds to what we think of as making a claim. Two things are worth highlighting. First, acting as though. 
This acknowledges that some of what we do in conversation might have a tentative or hypothetical quality, so the commitment is just to acting a certain way for the current context. This is perhaps relevant to the threat case, where the speaker might be behaving in a deceptive way concerning the content of the utterance. And notice also thereby. This says that it's the utterance itself that achieves all of this. We don't have a lot of sincerity conditions or escape clauses for the speaker. This is the normative quality I mentioned before. So it explains why there's a tight connection between declaratives and assertions, but it allows for much more. Let's look next at the imperative convention. This one is perhaps more interesting since the variation we see with imperatives seems greater than for declaratives. It says, if a speaker S utters an imperative with content P, then S thereby commits to having an effective preference for P. Obviously, for commands, we expect the speaker to desire that the content come true. Uh, here, the addressee should move their bicycle. The effective part captures the intuition that imperative usage generally presupposes that the content is obtainable. So here, moving the bike should be possible for the addressee. In contrast, fly to the moon might misfire or be interpreted in a non-literal way because it's infeasible. This convention also easily allows for invitation uses. The speaker merely expresses a preference. This might make the addressee feel some pressure to bring about the content. It could be mild pressure or great pressure depending on the context and content of the sentence. For cookies, it might depend on how invested the speaker is in having the addressee take one. For well wishes, the role of speaker preferences is again clear. Whether or not this is an effective preference, one that is achievable, will depend on the context. For many of these situations, we have a lot invested in acting as if the preferences are effective, particularly in cases like this one where we hope someone recovers from an illness. The role of preferences is clear in the driving directions case too, and we don't need to sort out what the precise force is. The sentence type convention suffices, I'd say. For a plea like rain, the commitment to a preference is again clear. The relative effectiveness of the preference is likely in doubt, which might account for the desperate nature of pleas like this. And there's an aspect of non-literalness or misfiring to many of these utterances. The final convention we'll look at is for interrogative clauses. It says, if a speaker S utters an interrogative with content Q, then S thereby commits to a preference for the hearer to commit himself to acting as though he believes an answer to Q. Notice the close connection with the declarative convention. What this part basically says is that the speaker of the interrogative hopes that the addressee will utter a declarative conveying the content of an answer to Q. So the essence of it is that the speaker wants the addressee to commit to an answer to Q. This covers the core uses as questions, of course, but even here there is a noteworthy twist. It's common to find claims in the literature that questions are felicitous acts only where the speaker doesn't know the answer. But then we need to say a lot of special things about questions on exams and other situations where the speaker wants to quiz the addressee. All these situations are covered already by the interrogative convention given here. For instance, suppose the addressee has recovered from passing out and the speaker wants to check to see whether the addressee is thinking coherently. Then what day is it is fine even though we expect the speaker to know the answer. The speaker just wants the addressee to commit to an answer. The convention naturally allows for heavily biased questions like what on earth are you doing? The speaker reveals a bias for one kind of answer and expresses a desire for the addressee to commit to one, presumably the same one. Uh, invitations are easily covered. Here we expect that the speaker's yes response will be met with some kind of ice cream. The same is true of requests like could you help me? Here again we expect at a social level that a yes response will be followed by the needed help. So, of course, responding with yes, though it conforms to the core convention, will nonetheless be regarded as rude, since it seems to involve willful misunderstanding of the questioner's goals. Summing up, then, the basic idea is that illocutionary force varies widely, whereas the core sentence-type conventions are more dependable. The core conventions explain the consistency of our intuitions about how sentence type should be used, while also explaining the wide variation we see in the actual speech acts that people successfully perform.